as the year goes on, I get closer and closer. To learn new skills and to build new acumen. We can always touch. It's not. When you get that, then you get a lot more excited about being around children. Normal, in a sense, and with all of the changes of course. Or how you can transform your own business. I'm developing the whole child, social, emotional. Traditional, Traditional route of teaching young people. How to set boundaries because this little victim here needs to know how to. Very well. So they use that term. Sometimes expanded them to go up to 40 minutes. All of those things in education, of course, those things are important. Student is going to our heads and our lungs. The affirmations in the mirror for about two minutes. What did you do in order to get yourself going? This is amazing. It happens what seems to happen quite a bit in our school. For the families to come and they... Uh, is that really for the child or is it for us, for the parents? And doing new things for our brain. Who's orchestrating everything in this universe? Which parts of the brain uh, are used on that map that we have. See you with your smiling face. At all, thank you very much for allowing me to join you. Namaste to you, my friends. Hello, hello and welcome. Thank you everyone who has joined us from different parts of the world to our early childhood global talk live spotlight talk show. My name is Atul and I'm a proud member and co-founder of this wonderful community and also one of the founders of a preschool chain in the name of Wow Kids. In India, we have more than 200 centers spread across 20 states of our country. For those who are new to this show, the purpose and intent of this show is to understand and for the most important time in the child's early years of growth, especially from birth to six years of age. We invite experts on different subjects from across the globe related to early childhood and have them share their experiences and knowledge with our community. So if you have any question during the show, feel free to leave a comment and we would be happy to take them up during this show. Okay. So let's get started. So today we have a very special guest, Terry Green. Hi, Terry. How are you? Good morning, afternoon or evening, wherever yes, you are. Good evening. <laughs> yes, it's good evening here. And uh, hi, Marion. Hello. Okay. So today it's my pleasure to introduce our guest, Terry Green. Terry has a master's in interdisciplinary early childhood education and is a member of NAEYC, SECA, NAREA, ASCD, and 0 to 3. She has 10 years of experience as a kindergarten teacher, along with 8 years as a director of a faith-based program. Terry has 20 years experience as an administrator in the public school, early learning setting, and served for 13 years of director of education in Head Start. Terry is most passionate about her work with Reggio Emilia and has traveled to Italy four times to work with study groups. She collaborates with a consultant from Reggio Emilia to implement Reggio in Head Start and the public school programs. I welcome Terry Green to our Spotlight show. Welcome, Thank Terry. You. Thank, you. Thank you. I'm glad. To, I'm excited to be here. Great, Thanks. great. Well, allow me to introduce my co-host of our very own, Marianne Erman. It's an honor to co-host the show with Marianne, who is the founder of International Respected Music with Mayor program from Florida, United States. She is also the moderator and backbone of this global community. She has recently had the privilege of being a TEDx speaker. She has spoken on topic building brains with music. Friends, it's a wonderful talk, and I request each one of you to see this wonderful talk, it's very informative. Feel free to comment or leave your thoughts below the talk on YouTube. Share it with your friends and family. We shall try to share a link of the talk. Marion, can we do that? I would love that. Thank you so much. 
please let's do that and over to Marian to take this forward. Thank you. Thank you at tool for that plug. I I wish you know, as many people as I can get to watch that to understand what music does for us, not just for children but just people in general. The better I believe would better world we could have if we all understood that it's the simple things that can make life and our bodies and brains much better. Um, yeah. Terry, thank you. I am so glad I ran into you at the SICA conference <laughs> this year. Um, our paths have crossed many times, and I'm sure as you watch the video, you saw many of your friends up there. So yeah. now you've joined the group. <laughs> um, we're going to start off today with a little bit of a conversation about what Reggio Emilia is. Um, when I was doing my master's work, I really became intrigued with Reggio because I loved how it connected um, with children. And so what I'd like you to do to start is tell us a little bit about Reggio Emilia mm -hmm. and what makes it different from Montessori and Waldorf. I think that it um, says a lot when Head Start wants to work with Reggio, you know, and why would that be? So please, Terry, take it away. All right. Well, as I said, um, I'm so excited to be here today to not only to um, share what my experience has been, but also to hear from other folks and and what they um, what their experiences are like. Um, we are all better together. And I believe that. And that is part of the um, philosophy, if you want to call it that, although they don't appreciate that word uh, of the Reggio work. Um, <clears throat> Just to help you get some context around without going into too much history, you need to understand when we talk about the Reggio work, uh, first of all, Reggio Emilia is not an early childhood anything. Reggio Emilia is a city in Italy. Uh, it's actually a very small city. It's not a big, large city. It's, uh, it's, it's a smaller city in north central Italy. Um, we don't have a better name for the uh, approach that they have developed in their early learning centers. Um, so we just call it the Reggio Emilia approach. Um, but we need to understand that it is a city and part of what makes Reggio work with young children um, unique is the fact that is um, the city is involved. It is part of the culture and climate of the city itself. Uh, and when you visit there, you, you start to realize how much it is a part of the common culture. But really the schools in Reggio Emilia were started after World War II. And um, this, the town leaders, the city leaders, and, and really the women in the city um, realized that if they wanted a different kind of world, a different kind of um, <clears throat> community for them to live in, um, they had to start with the youngest children because we know from all of the research that we've we've yes. got that the younger the child is, the more, no, that didn't come out right, the more we can um, support young children's development, um, the stronger they're going to be as individuals when they get older. And it starts at the very youngest age. And so um, they began to, to build preschools centers um, and it was not well received. They had terrible, terrible uh, problems with the community and people said they were uh, 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 practicing uh, voodoo and all kinds of horrible things <laughs> when they first started. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, they struggled a while and they finally got a new leader. His name was Loris Malaguzzi and he was a psychologist. And what he did when to, to counter all of that was he picked the classrooms up and he took them out into the piazzas. And he let the piazzas, he let the people in the community see what the children were doing so that they started to understand and, and have uh, interest and, and buy into what was going on uh, in those schools. So, um, you know, it, it was just an amazing transformation as to how the schools became involved. I mean, this community became involved in the schools and it was nothing but just going out and showing the people what children could learn and how quickly children could learn. And once they got past that, and actually um, the Pope even approved their work, because as if you're familiar with Italy, um, the, the church is very strong across the, uh, in terms of culture and climate. 
and determine a lot of that, especially back, this was in the 60s. And so they began to really thrive and start to build um, this, this amazing um, group of, of early learning programs. They are not the only, the Reggio schools are owned by the city of, it, of Reggio Emilia, but they are not the only preschools available in the community. There are still um, faith-based from the Catholic church that are available. There are several other opportunities um, this is just one, and it happens to be the largest. The reason we're talking about it today is it's because it is a very unique approach, and the uh, the people in the United States. And I'm not really sure. Sweden actually was the first country to discover that there was something special going on in this community with young children, and they began a relationship with the schools in Reggio Emilia first. And then not long after that, in the late 80s, um, the United States um, sent some people over uh, to look at it. Carolyn Edwards went, I don't know if you all remember Carolyn, she's gone now. Um, uh, uh, George Foreman went, uh, several people uh, took a trip over. Uh, Lillian Katz, I think was in the oh. first group that went. Um, several people went and they came back and just were completely blown away by what they observed and what, what they saw and learned from uh, the schools. Sorry, I had, a, I had a cat in the room. Uh, and so when that happened, then the United States began a real interest in learning about the schools in Reggio Emilia. And um, that's the history of how we became interested. And then they brought over an exhibit of the work of the children. And, and um, the first time I saw that was when I was just, it, it transformed me. It transformed everything I knew about children and families. Now, having said that, to answer your other question of what is Reggio Amelia, what makes it unique? This is a, an approach because of why they started this, because they wanted to develop a different kind of society. They had just gone through World War II. They did not want to see another situation like Mussolini or Hitler. They wanted people to be independent thinkers. They wanted them to look at the greater good and always take into consideration the greater good of the community. So, so they set out to develop schools that for very young children that would do that that would help children to, to focus on collaboration, on problem solving, on um, learning to work together and accept uh, constructive criticism from their, from their co from the other children in their groups, to work um, almost completely in, in collaboration. How and so, important. I'm sorry. I said that's so very important. It is so very important. And yeah. that's kind of what it makes it different from Montessori. Maria Montessori, I always say Montessori and Reggio, I talk with my hands. Montessori and Reggio are two uh, ends, different ends of the same string because Ma Maria Montessori wanted, they were, she was looking at individual children surviving on the street and giving them the skills they needed as an individual to survive. Reggio takes that the next step and says, okay, we also need us to learn to survive as a community, as a group of human beings. And so what do we need in our schools that will support um, that thinking of, of being together and, and doing everything for the greater good uh, nice. without losing the individualization, without really losing the individualization. Nice. I think I think the biggest difference between Reggio and Waldorf is really more around um, how the teaching takes place. Um, it's they're both very play based, um, and I have not worked in Waldorf very much. I mean, I studied it, but not to, to some degree because once I learned about Reggio schools, I was hooked, <laughs> and so yeah. I've sort of stayed in that realm. Um, but um, I think it's more about the um, the collaboration between the adults and children and the kinds of things that um, children decide in the Reggio schools. And we'll talk more, maybe, I think, about that as we move forward this morning. Okay, so that's really interesting. Um, I love, no one has ever clarified that for me as well as you just did, Terry. Oh, well, thank so, you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, you know, I've wondered, like, what is the big difference? So basically, you could think of it as, and correct me if I'm wrong, but... Just to clarify, <clears throat> excuse me. So, your Marie Montessori is 
let's make each person strong as an individual. And Reggio Emilia is let's make people strong as a community mm -hmm. so that they learn they're not alone. They're working mm -hmm. together and yeah. are stronger. Yeah, there's actually a very one of the stronger Reggio school Reggio inspired. And there's one thing I want to clarify right up front. We are <coughs> never going to be a Reggio Emilia school in the United States because we're not in the city of Reggio Emilia. We are inspired by their work. We want to learn from their work, but we don't ever want to call ourselves Reggio schools because they are the schools in Reggio Emilia. But Beth uh, McDonald in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, has a Montessori school that is a Reggio school. That is and cool. She she has been one of the one of the strong leaders in Reggio work in the United States, and and she was a Montessori uh, school for many many years. She had, owns her own private school, and she was a private school um, a Montessori school for many years before she discovered the Reggio work. And so she has blended those two so well together. That's awesome. That is like I kept thinking that like how. Could that happen, you know, because that to me would be really great. And then throw a little Waldorf in there. And <laughs> <laughs> but um, Terry, I have a question before we move forward. Go ahead. Uh, it's I've just heard that, you know, that some places they say that Reggio also focuses on parents and community partnership. Which is very That's different in other styles. So is, is that true? Is that, you know, that. Absolutely. Parents are equally involved and the community is also involved in the in the whole learning process. Can you? Yes, it, uh, it, is, it is very true. And families are a huge part of the work. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite events that they have, the parents came to the care. The parents actually drive the, the schools. They have I mean, they make the decisions about the schools, along with the children, by the way, because the children are always front and center. But one of the most important um Thing, or one of my favorite stories um, is that we they had a group of parents from one of the centers that wanted to learn to be storytellers so they could tell stories to their children at home. That was really important to them. So they had storytellers come in and teach storytelling to the families. And it became a an event um, that now happens every year. It's called Reggio Nara. And it's um, all of the families, but also storytellers from all over come and they have a night when everybody goes out into the piazzas and they sit in little groups and they tell stories. And it started wow. from some families who wanted to be, learn to be better storytellers for their own children. And I know, Atul, cool. that was one of the things you were focusing on with your program yes. you're building is teaching that parents how awesome. storytelling starts in yeah. infancy. Yes. yes. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. It's, the fact it's with very the other important thing. because... I personally feel that uh, at such a young age, parents are their first teachers. Definitely, there, there's a lot of role responsibility that we have as individuals. But there's a lot, mm -hmm. a child or a baby spends more time with the parents. You know, they will come for us to our preschool for three to four hours. But the rest of the time they spend with their family. So uh, it's important to engage with the parents and tell them how to engage with their babies or children in a meaningful way, which and, is now a huge gap now. Yeah, and, and that dialogue in the schools in Reggio Emilia, that dialogue goes both ways because not only do the teachers help the children, the parents when they want to learn something like storytelling, but also the parents guide the teachers on their child and what their child how to help support their child the best. Another favorite thing of mine and in and, and Reggio Emilia uh, that they do is anytime a child in their center has a new baby at home, often if the parents are, are open to it, the whole classroom goes to meet the baby. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that is so cool. Yeah. It, there are so many connections with family. And then, like I said, the entire community, because they do all of these huge projects out in the community two or three times a year to get the whole community engaged in the, the schools and what is going on in their schools. Um, there are so many wonderful stories. We struggle with that in the United States, trying to really connect the community to our schools just because, I don't know, we just, that's something we really struggle with. Uh, and those of us who are in the Reggio groups here in the United States, 
work at that all the time. It's we can get families engaged, but the, the community is really a struggle. Yeah, I think it's important. Like when we say the parents are the first teachers, we also have to extend that into parents are the forever teachers. Yes. Because you are a teacher with your child until your life is over. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, uh, my daughter's 33, but I still am a teacher presence in her life as long as, as well as all the other hats that I wear. Um, and so it, it's good when the parents can come in. Um, there are some, so many type curriculums that don't want parents to get involved. They might upset the apple cart or teach something differently than the way the teacher envisioned it. And that's one of the reasons why what happens in Reggio is so wonderful because they watch how the children envision it. And um, I think that's very interesting. So the program begins at what age? About between four and six months. The families have leave time in Italy until their babies are, I think, four months, I think is what it is. But anyway, uh, and then once that um, they get at that age, then they can enter the program. So they do have very young children um, mobile. Most of them, the majority of children are a year old, at least before they start. Uh, some are a little bit younger for different reasons. And that's changed, too. One of the things that's so I mean, I've been involved with learning about the schools in Reggio Emilia, or learning from the schools in Reggio Emilia for, gosh, close to 30 years now. <laughs> and one of the things that's, that, that I have to emphasize is they are constantly adapting to the changing world. They're, they're, not, st they're not stagnant in any way, shape, or form. They keep their foundation and what they believe about children and families but, and the role of teachers but they are constantly changing. And one of the things that I have been privileged enough to see happen in the schools there is that when I first got involved, it was very homogeneous community. People were for all from there. Most of them had lived there. They all spoke Italian. And when I first um, got involved, they had just begun to get um, immigrants. And that was brand new. And so they, they were very quickly in in the schools, with the families, with the community leaders, what do we? How do we approach this? What do we need to do to meet these needs of these new families? Well, now they have families from I don't know how many different countries, and they have they struck they fight it all the time to try to make it work. But they're constantly they don't give up. They're constantly looking at how do we how do we embrace this and make it make our community stronger. So when you're with a Reggio um, inspired program, um, are there books around? Are there materials? What? That is such a good question because a lot of people hear Reggio and they think it's just a free for all. It is not at all a free for all. There are very specific, the classroom, the difference when you look into the classroom is not, there are, there are books, there are materials, there are um, uh, very natural um, um, mat materials, a lot of found things, a lot of found items and stuff, but there are also Legos and, and you know, baby dolls. And, you know, it's not about the stuff. It's about what are you doing with it and what are you, how are you approaching children's education? Um, and they do a lot of project work. A lot of what you see is, is project work, which is long-term work with children. And one of the things that we don't do well in, in, a, in the United States with children is to teach them um, to be persistent and to work on something over a long period of time. We tend to say, okay, you've got 20 minutes in the block area. And as soon as that 20 <laughs> minutes is up, then go do something else. Well, maybe I'm right in the middle of what I'm building. Right. So it's a lot about respecting children's time and giving them the time they need to explore and investigate the things they want to do. But there's also time to play. There's time to play dress up. There's time to, you know, build, build just for fun. There's time, you know, it's, it's a combination of, of directed and supported projects and then just time to be children. And the younger ch the child, the more time there is for, for exploration um, that is not as, um, I don't want to say directed because it's not directed, but not as uh, focused. 
uh, on on a particular uh, thing. So, uh, but yes, and lots of they support literacy in a big way, and and they are constantly um, self evaluating on are we doing what we need to do based on the newest research we have on ch for children. The other thing Reggio schools do is they invite Waldorf and Montessori and forest schools and whoever else wants to come have a conversation about how do we best support young children and, and their families. And so there are always these study groups that are going on that are um, looking at what everybody does and figuring out what works, what's best, what, you know, what can we integrate into each other's approach to young children. And I think that's really important. It's not a, a thing that, oh, you have to do it this way to be a Reggio inspired school. Reggio Amelia hopes to inspire other educators to think and, and appreciate all the things we know about young children and how they learn and grow and their families. You have a comment here from Ron Schwally. Mm -hmm. She says, yes, I love that. If they work with intention and purpose, let them keep going for an hour if they want to love this. Yes. And that is really key in the Reggio work. It's, it's very, um, that's very important. And they can come back to their work. They can leave their work up and out. Um, I know in our country, one of the problems that we have sometimes is that the custodians don't really appreciate when we leave the work up. <laughs> and they think when well, we've got a bunch of cardboard and blocks and wood pieces from outside and it, it to them, it looks like trash. <laughs> right. And we're going, no, this is important work. Just please don't bother. Leave it alone. Well, one, when, of, one of the great literacy things you can do though, is the children can write a note to the, to the custodian. And so this is our work, yeah. you know, great <laughs> idea. Now, when I was right, working, before, on, sorry. Before we go ahead, I would like to give a shout out to people who have joined, who are watching this show. There are a lot of new people who have joined today. Uh, but anyways, uh, hi, Sana. So Sana is watching Wow Kids Bright Minds, which is Seema. Then we have Sam Sana, who is watching from Bangalore. Then Supreet Kaur is watching. Then we have Liz Hins Hannon from San Francisco. Ron Shuali. And Siddharth, hi guys, thanks for joining in. If you have any questions, please post and we shall be very happy to take them up during the show. We'd love right, questions. Marianne, I'm so sorry. No yes. worries. We it's love great. questions. Um, so Terry, when I was studying with Dr. Jan McCarthy, who I don't know, you know, Jan, um, she showed us this video, which is what sold me on what was happening in Reggio Emilia. And I think that what I'd like you to share a little bit, um, expand upon it is, I think makes it clearer for pe people, is the video showed how the children decided they wanted to learn about horses. And what Jan wanted us to comprehend was that through following their lead about horses, the children were learning math, science, language, engineering, et cetera, because they did, and as I said, please expand on it. They used clay to make horses. They looked pictures of horses. They went to a farm and watched horses move. They drew their own pictures. They read books. And they basically became like horse experts and during the process developed vocabulary and working together, et cetera. And I think that is a big, beautiful piece that I want to make sure people understand. Okay, sure. We can talk about that. And yes, that is that is a huge piece of it. This idea of deep diving into something that the children have an interest in. And then how do you meet those developmental skills and, and uh, abilities through that, and that becomes very, very important. Um, people sometimes think that Reggio Amelia um, is opposed to assessing children's development. That's not true at all. They're constantly <laughs> assessing their development. So yes, that's a really good ex uh, example of, of knowing what children are interested in. And, and you know, it, we assume that we know what children are interested in. And that's one of the first things that you have to do is put that aside as a teacher and just say, no, really, what are they interested in? And because they don't always, especially if, if the children are new to this approach, they're not used to being asked. 
So they don't, may not always know. You may have to get to it through some conversations. Um, but the, the, the opportunity to know what you, what more about what you want to know takes time. And we go back to that time thing. We, that horse project probably lasted six months or a year didn't mean that they were working all day every day, <laughs> but they re kept revisiting it and coming back to it as part of their day and part of their project work. And so um, through that, educating is, ed educing is better than educating. Ed educing is better than educating. Gotcha. <laughs> um, so I have to read a little more closely. Um so like with the with the horse thing, one of the things that Malaguzzi really, Dr. Malaguzzi, Lawrence Malaguzzi really believed in was the languages of children. And he said children need to express their language, their um, thoughts and ideas in a, a, a different, many different languages. And he has, there's a poem about the hundred languages of children. And he has since, since decided there were more than a hundred, but a uh, hundred languages of children. So you will see anytime there is um, an opportunity for children to, um, do a deep dive into an exploration into horses or um, in our case, we have a, a group that's, that's just fascinated with bugs. This is a younger uh, group of children. This is a toddler yeah. group, but they are fascinated with bugs. So this whole year they have been learning about bugs and they have been out discovering bugs on the playground, not bugs that live somewhere that they've never seen before, but what's in your, what's where you are. And they've done a big study. They've um, they have um, written books, st stories about about the uh, bugs, the different bugs. They have used the internet to look up where the bugs, what kind of bugs they found. Um, they've counted bugs. <laughs> they've built bug houses. And in order to build a bug house, you have to plan what that house needs to look like. You have to decide what materials you need to build a bug house. You have to measure and make sure that it fits the bugs that you are trying to make a house for. So you're doing those mm -hmm. math problems. You're using all those tools, math tools. Um, and then, um, you know, they wrote letters to their bugs. Um, <laughs> some of them um, wanted to write notes to the bugs. So, you know, it's <laughs> investigating what the bugs eat. So you're getting that science in there. So it's, you know, it's investigating with, with a lot of meaning and really helping children use the skills, the language, because they learned all the bug names, you know, but they also learned um, about the life cycle of bugs. Um, I learned that there's a bug, the children taught me that there's a bug that has, is born with no mouth. And they live one day and they cannot eat. Wow. And, and yeah, who knew? And Thanks to, to me. Now I know that. <laughs> exactly. And that 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 idea that teachers don't have to know, be the keeper of all the knowledge, and that children can teach us and that we can learn together with them is a big part of this as well. So this idea of teaching not stopping and teaching math or stopping and teaching literacy, but incorporating that into something deeper uh, is, is really important. I know um, a lot of us in the United States use the class instrument to evaluate classrooms, to assess mm -hmm. classrooms for coaching purposes and lots of other, uh, it's really big and head start. I don't know if it's used internationally or not, but one of the things that we are really poor at in the United States is concept development. We do not give children the opportunity to do deep dives into uh, a single uh, idea or uh, information. And so um, we can really raise those scores when we use this Reggio Milli approach because we are doing that deep dive and we're really helping children get deep in the weeds on whatever it is. And sometimes you'll have, especially with toddlers, you'll have a project that you take off uh, on and you think they're really interested in it. It goes nowhere. And it just, <laughs> they get bored with it and they don't want to continue. But often you can also find things that they're really going to go with for a long time, or they'll leave something for a while and come back to it and want to transform it into some other kind of project. And right. so leaving the work up so that the children can revisit it becomes very important so that they can recall, but also build on that. Well, so though this is mostly children three and older. What about the younger children? 
you know, like we're talking the four month olds. Mm -hmm. They're not old enough yet to tell you what they're interested in. So how do you follow their lead and what type of activities would you do with this group that can't tell you? <laughs> and that's much different. I don't want to say harder because once you learn how to do it, but it's really about reading children's cues. One of the most important things with infants and young toddlers are those reading those cues. And, and with babies, those cues are in their, in their gaze, in their feet, their feet talk all the time. Their feet are constantly communicating. If we watch, especially uh, when you're talking to them, having communication, they everything shows in their feet. But also in in knowing about development and understanding what children need to develop. So, uh, for instance, with young young babies, one of the things we've noticed we know about young children is uh, babies is they're tactile. So a lot of the experiences that we put forth to see if they're interested in would be um, things that feel different, different kinds of paper, for instance, so that children can experience the different feelings of paper and uh, just tactily ex explore it. Um, another thing might be, um, of course, outside. My goodness, with babies, outside is so important. Um, but, but grass versus concrete versus sand versus, you know, all of those tactile kinds of, thing, uh, of uh, materials that you can give babies to explore. And again, sometimes they'll take up a real interest and they'll stay interested in that for a good long time. Um, when they get a little bit older, um, sometimes you can, um, they can show you an interest by going and revisiting something. Children um, are fascinated by light at a very young age. So using light and shadow and uh, we have, I don't, I don't know how many different kinds of, of, of uh, flashlights we have in our oh, that's cool. so that children can, can explore different kinds of light and different kinds of reflection and different kinds of, of ways to use light. Um, I have a wonderful video of a, of a seventh, well, he's about eight months old. He's sitting, but he's not walking yet. Um, and the older toddlers in his room were beading with very, very small beads, making bracelets with very, very small beads. He was fascinated by that. And he watched the older children. So a teacher sat down with him with a piece of wire and a tiny little bead to try to help him because he really wanted to do it. She had to be right there because he might put it in his mouth. He tried a couple right. of times of and we had to say, whoops, no, nope, you can't do that. So, but she sat there with him for seven minutes. We say children, young children don't have any um, uh, ability to stay, to focus on things. Seven minutes, That's this child tried to put this one bead on this tiny little piece of wire. Wow. He finally did it. Wow. And he was done. He didn't need to do any more. He just needed to accomplish that. Yeah. So staying with that child and recognizing how important that was to that very young child and not saying, oh, gosh, I can't let him have the bead because he might swallow it or, oh, my goodness, he's too young or he can't or I, won't, I don't want to see him get frustrated when he fails. We do that really, really badly as a culture <laughs> kind of. Um, instead, she let him keep trying and fail and she encouraged him. She didn't make him stay there, but she stayed with him until he was he was satisfied that he had. Now, what we forgot to do was make a, an end on the other end of the wire so that it wouldn't fall off. So let's oh, get it off. <laughs> that was our bad. But he didn't care. He got it on there. That's what he needed to accomplish. And look That's at the motor. Look at the motor development that happened through that. Oh look yeah. Look at the look at the fine motor. Mm -hmm. Fine motor and the and the. Um, and the ability to sustain an interest in something. That's seven wonderful. Seven minutes for, for a seven-month-old is a long time. So well, I, I haven't heard my favorite word come up yet. What is Mus it? Music. Music. Oh, music is, <laughs> yeah, music is huge. Music is huge in, in Reggio work. Um, first of all, it's always huge with babies. Singing to babies. Babies sing to us. Oh, and we yes. need to hear that. Babies sing to us naturally. And we need to sing back to them. That's always important. But um, music is a really big part. And one of the things that Reggio Amelia schools do is have what they call ateliers. And ateliers are interest um, rooms or areas in your 
building, sometimes it's a closet, it's wherever you can find in our, in our schools, um, that focus on one thing, maybe light. Light is a, an atelier that, that we've had in the past, but um, one that's very, very popular uh, with us, and, they, and a lot of schools in Red Joe have it too, are our music ateliers. Now, one of the things that you will never see in a Reggio school, and not in mine, if I can remind my teachers often enough, no, no play instruments, no pretend, real mm -hmm. things. Yes. No, real guitars, real yes. violins, real drums, real, real, real instruments, so that children learn yeah. to appreciate the real thing. One of the foundations of Reggio Amelia is this idea of real and not pretend things um you know we don't buy a lot of materials um out of catalogs that are like math kits and those kinds of things because we want children to learn about real math in the real world same thing with music we want them to learn about real music there's a beautiful video um uh in a, it's called a day in the life of the school a day in the life uh, of the schools and the infant toddler there's an infant toddler in a preschool the infant toddler uh, the children are I don't know what they're doing, but anyway, and the teacher just sits down, starts playing the violin and the children just flop Stop. to her. Yep. She sits down and puts the violin on the floor then and very quietly, she doesn't say anything. She doesn't tell them they can't. She doesn't tell them how. She just sits there. And as the child investigates, and these are toddlers, as the child investigates, she will um, support that by like the child tried to pluck a string and it didn't sound right. So she showed, she just demonstrated and that she didn't say anything. It's beautiful to watch. And then yes. another child comes and the two children uh, interact with, with the violin. And what, when I saw this the first time, what um, someone told me was this one child is brand new to the school and doesn't know a lot of children yet. And so that this connections being made through music with a friendship. Absolutely. They also have older children a lot of times come and, and play for the for the younger children, like school age children come and bring their instruments and play. Mm -hmm. It's so much of what the music with mayor philosophy is. And I, you know, was influenced a lot by Reggio Waldorf. I really, you know, love that philosophy. I had a musical petting zoo one time where I invited people from the community to come in and just play the instruments. And the kids were 10 months to four years old. We had a cellist and a violinist and a banjo and bongos and just let, they played a little bit and then exactly what you said. Those children were so used to, you know, don't touch it, that's the nap, don't touch it. And instead they would go, go ahead, touch. And mm -hmm. that's how they learn, you know. You, Absolutely. I always say in my workshops, say to teachers, you hold up a puppet, you don't then put it away because you paid $15 for it. <laughs> you know, don't want the kids to ruin it. You want to make sure that lesson is really embedded. Mm -hmm. You leave that puppet out. Yeah, all materials are always available to all the children. That's really important. Music is such a powerful way to build connections and create opportunities for learning. That is absolutely mm -hmm. true. Thanks, Rebecca. And everybody can, and everybody can sing. Everybody That's right. can. And babies I, are born singing. That my singing. my TED talk is how I start out with that. Howard Gardner says music is the first of the music of the intelligence to awaken in us. And babies come out singing. You know, they do. I'm sorry, you wanted to say something, didn't you? At all? Yes, I just wanted to ask a question actually uh, to Terry. This program for Reggio Emilia, which are for infant and toddlers, what is the duration of the program? So, you know, the parents come, or is it an evening program or is it for half an hour, one hour? What is the duration? The uh, actual, the yeah, the actual. Yeah, the actual center for infants and toddlers um, is actually full day because their parents because parents are working, so um, they are open from seven in the morning until seven at night. Um, the 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 day is very long. The day is very long, but there's a you know there's a big break in there. Uh, but yeah, the the families were most of the families in in Italy both both parents are working. 
And so okay. it's a very and very so parents who are not working by any chance, like Marion, you are also uh, teaching a lot of uh, toddlers and uh, you know infants. So your it's program there. when they come to your community center, is it for half an hour, one hour, two hours? What is the duration of that program for very less than two years? Or it's, I will say birth to two years of age. It's 45 minutes. And um, we kind of know that um, this age group is not going to last at an activity for longer than 15 minutes. You know, that's really yeah. pushing it. So the way the Music with Mayor class is designed is basically three 15-minute pieces. Sessions. Like the first 15 oh. minutes is just like going around the circle, letting everybody sing, using rhythm instruments. Then we stand up for 15 minutes and we do active, more gross motor, move around, dance, play with a parachute, have a parade. Then we sit back down for 15 minutes, read a couple of books, do some bonding songs so that you're keeping the attention of the child um, and also yeah. the parent. Um, and it's important to follow the lead. And that's why, you know, Reggio is, so, they were doing such a good job because follow the lead and getting the parents coming in, extending when you, when you have the child and the parents are at work, I think a very important piece, and I'm thinking you're going to agree with me, Terry, is extending it to go home so that the parents can continue to do what you've done. Yeah. Uh, yes, of course. Actually, very, very important. And I so how do you it. help with that? Um, like extending the activities so that the parents can do them at home, which is what that tool wants to do is like teach the parents, how can you do this at home? Well, and, and I think, yes, I think we have to get our minds around. I agree that, I mean, and, and everything about Reggio, but I think we have to get our minds around the idea that with them, they don't have to think about because of their connection with the family already. They don't think in terms of what can I do to help the parents at home. It's already there because they're sharing constantly what they're mm -hmm. doing at school, how it's working. But a good example of what they do to really support that is that children got the toddlers, the very young children got very interested in this has been several years ago now, very interested in movement. And, and children are anyway, and, and how their bodies move. And so the teachers um, didn't know, none of them were dancers or knew anything about body movement, really. So they <laughs> go out and find people who do uh, know something about teaching children how to move in space and, and to really study the body. And again, you realize that where we go, oh, let's move, there's this very slow, long periods of time very uh, revisiting it several times, having that person come back and do. So as part of that, while yes, they worked with the children while the children were in school, but they had a class for the children and teacher, children and parents together. Yes. So the parents were yeah. also, now it wasn't, here's how you teach your child to move. It was come and move with your child. That's what I do. Yes. Help that yes. child yes. By yes. Moving with the child. Same thing if you're doing art or music, it's come and do with, never here, do that, go home and do this with your child. It's, it's always connected. And again, a lot of it's done out in the community so that come on out and join us and we'll, we'll work together. So it's this idea of, of with instead of to really it's shifting off of that to, to with, with yeah. parents, with children, teachers are seen as commuter, as community, as um, supporters of children, but also as learners with children. Absolutely. And we're getting near the end of our time. So I would encourage anyone that has a question, please post it now um, because Terry is going to be leaving us soon. And I wouldn't want you to miss the opportunity to ask her something that you would like to know. So um, as we're getting in closing, I know a two might have a comment or Terry, you might want to say something that maybe we didn't hit upon, but we also want to make sure that you can let people know where they can go to learn more. Uh, if they wanted to find out if there was a Reggio inspired um, program in their area, how do they do that? 
Okay, yes. There, the Reggio inspired work is being done all over the world. Um, I do know, I think it's 56 countries that have Reggio um, affiliations with the Reggio. But what happened after Reggio Emilia schools with, with, let's say we've got a comment, with so much more empowering that with is so much more empowering than for. Also meeting families where they are in the community is so important. <clears throat> I agree. And it's much harder in our country than it is there, I will tell you, because people are out more in Italy. But um, one of the things that became really important was sharing this idea and knowing that they wanted to learn from other programs. So they um, developed this Malaguzzi Institute, which is a place to come together and learn about uh, Reggio Mili, but also for other educators to come together and talk. So they have affiliates uh, that want to know more about this work and really work with the schools uh, in Reggio Emilia through this institution and this uh, Reggio Foundation. And um, so uh, if you want to, if you want to know if there's a group in your country that is affiliated with the Reggio schools, you can go to reggioamelia.it, like Italy, IT, and there's a wealth of information there um, of what's available, the study tours that they offer in their country, um, what other there's a map of what countries have Reggio affiliations so that you can connect with your people uh, in your country where you are. Uh, plus, you can buy materials. They have tons of, of videos and books about their work that are available. Now, if you buy them directly through, through Reggio Children, you'll have to pay whatever import tax your country has. Uh, with us, the North American Reggio Emilia Alliance, which is Canada, Mexico, and the United States, we can buy through them without having to pay the import tax. So, um, so we, you know, that's really important. So I really encourage you to go learn more if you're interested. Okay, so um, before we close, I do want to say Rebecca, who has been making the comments, she will be joining us next week. And I think she loved that last comment so much because her talk is going to be on how it's so important to talk with children and not two children. Um, yeah. And so Reggio is all about that. Mm -hmm. um, and a tool, was there something you wanted to add here or a question you had? No, I think, I think that's it for the day. We've had a very informative session. We have. You want to conclude, uh, Marian? Or... Thank you so much, Terry. Um, you clarified a few things for me that I didn't quite understand and made it just go click, click. And I really do appreciate that so much and your time, because I know you're busy. Um, well, yeah, so- I believe in this, but I also believe in what you all are doing. I think this international connection is amazing. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, you're so Thank welcome. You. So welcome. Thank you right, so great. much. Stay with us for a moment. Okay. So friends, we had an amazing time today hearing Terry Green all about Reggio Emilia. My sincere thanks to Terry for uh, taking her precious time out for our community. And I also thank Marion for joining us today on this show. I thank all of you who have been viewing our uh, weekly shows and taking your precious time out to watch uh, our shows. Our best wishes until we meet again next week with Rebecca Wiener. Right, Marion? Yes. Yes. All right. See you next week, next week. <laughs>